Welcome to the Proverbs 910 Ministries podcast, No Trash, Just Truth. We're your hosts and co-founders of Proverbs 910 Ministries, Chris Paxson and Rose Spiller. We're continuing on in our series, The Best Sermon Ever, which is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The last episode, we ended at verse 20 of Matthew 5 with Jesus telling his disciples that their righteousness needed to exceed that of the Pharisees, something that only God can do by saving us and clothing us in Christ's righteousness. That's right. Jesus rejected all ideas of human merit and works-based righteousness as a way to get to heaven. He directed that idea directly at the Pharisees in the parable from Luke 18, 13, where the Pharisee is praying out loud and saying, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. While the tax collector says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man, meaning the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That parable always gets to me. I know. How arrogant that Pharisee is. It's so arrogant. And it's no wonder they were Jesus' direct target. The Pharisees thought they were keeping the law well enough to merit salvation. But the law was designed to show us that we can't merit salvation. Hmm. We need a savior because we can't ever be good enough on our own. In the very next section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes the teachings of the Pharisee and says, you have heard it said, in other words, this is what the Pharisees are teaching you. And he follows each one of these statements up with, but I say. He tells them these things with authority as the lawgiver. Jesus is going to show the true meaning of the law by explaining how all-encompassing they were meant to be at the beginning. Starting in Matthew 5, verse 21, Jesus says, You have heard it said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. The Jewish religious leaders would have been shaking their heads in agreement at this point. Yep, yep, that's what we're teaching. They agreed that the law said that murder brings judgment. Many of us would be standing there nodding our heads right along with them, thinking, we're okay. We haven't murdered anyone. (laughs) Yeah, that's what we would be thinking. (laughs) There are a few things to note, though, about the words that say, murder makes you liable for judgment. The commandment not to murder was the sixth of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 13 is that commandment, and it says, you shall not commit murder. But the part of it that says, Whoever murders will be liable to judgment was tacked on by the Jewish religious leaders. Their add-on interpretation wasn't wrong. God did give us government to impose penalties for the laws that he gave. Numbers 3530 says, If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death at the evidence of witnesses, but no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. But it's an example of the Pharisees adding to the text. And it wasn't exactly what the original text meant. No, it wasn't. The Pharisees meant that whoever murders will be unable to escape the punishment imposed by the court, their court, the tribunal of seven men in several cities in Palestine or the Sanhedrin who were in Jerusalem. They weren't talking about the judgment of God. They weren't talking about being subject to God's wrath and punishment. But then Jesus takes this commandment to the next level the full meaning of the law. He says to them, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hells of fire. Anger is an inside you thing. You could be angry right now, Chris. And you wouldn't even know it. Uh, I think I might. You probably would because you know me well. (laughs) But unless you showed most people some outward behavior that told them you were angry, they'd never know. God desires inward cleanness. Jesus rebukes the Pharisees of looking clean on the outside, but inwardly being full of greed and wickedness in Luke eleven thirty nine, 39. So when Jesus is saying anger makes you liable for judgment, he can't be talking about a tribunal of men judging. How would they always be able to see if someone was angry? Jesus must be talking about God, the only one who can look into a man's heart and see what's really there. Exactly. Can you imagine being in this group 
One minute you're standing there agreeing with Jesus and thinking to yourself you're good to go because you never murdered anyone. And then Jesus says that even anger brings God's judgment. Rose, we should have titled this series, The Most Shocking Sermon Ever. Because these people are hearing Jesus say some shocking things, like one thing after another. They certainly are, and you're right. Some of the things he teaches are shocking even to us. They are. So then Jesus goes on to say that anyone who insults his brother, which in some versions says idiot or raka, which is a word showing contempt for someone, will be liable to the Sanhedrin council. And anyone who calls his brother a fool is liable to the fires of hell or the Gehenna fires. Those were fires that were in the valley of Hinnom, which was a narrow gorge south of Jerusalem. That's where the Israelites worshiped the false god Molech by offering their infants to be burned in that fire. Oh, that's makes horrible. Me, makes me sick it makes to my me cringe. stomach every time I hear that. When Jesus says your brother, he's not talking about our biological brothers and sisters. And it's not even just our brothers and sisters in Christ. But in a large sense, it means anyone. And once he's explained that treating people badly is deserving of God's judgment, even with something we might consider insignificant compared to murder, like name calling, Jesus goes on to say, in light of that, I have some instructions for you about your offerings. In Matthew 5, 23 to 26, Jesus says, So, if you're offering your gift on the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Reconciliation with someone who you wronged takes priority over giving your offering. You're still to give, but after you've gone to the person you've wronged to reconcile with them. It's our duty to go to someone that we've hurt or done wrong to. We should seek them out. Reconciliation means to settle the difficulty, to acknowledge what you've done wrong, and ask for forgiveness. And if you owe a debt which ought to be paid, pay it. Do everything in your power to have the matter settled. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says do it quickly. Using the idea of a matter taken to court, you'd be better to do it before judgment is handed down. And this is also a picture of being reconciled to God. If you're not saved, ask God to forgive you of your sins now. Because judgment's coming and we don't know when. Absolutely. Moving on to verses 27 and 28 in Matthew 5, Jesus addresses breaking another commandment, committing adultery. The Jewish religious leaders also taught the people that they weren't to commit adultery. So once again, they'd have been nodding in agreement with Jesus on this one. Just like murder was thought of as only that specific act, adultery was only considered adultery if the actual act of it was happening. And just like anger can't be seen by a man unless it culminates in an outward act, Jesus is going to teach the Pharisees that adultery can also be an internal sin of the heart and of the mind, a sin worthy of the one who can seize judgment. Jesus says, You have heard it said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Adultery was considered an extremely serious offense. Leviticus 20.10 tells us, If a man commits adultery, both the adulterer and adulteress shall be put to death. Adultery broke the marriage covenant, and marriage is supposed to be a reflection of God's relationship with his people. And I want to say that Jesus isn't adding to the law here. This was the intent of the law right from the beginning. God has always required purity, not only outwardly, but purity of the heart too. And after explaining the breadth of that command, Jesus uses hyperbole to emphasize the importance of it. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. The eyes and the hands are two of the most vital parts of the body. In this illustration, the eye is the instrument used to tempt, and the hand represents the physical actions that can happen because of the lusting. Like you said, this is hyperbole. Jesus is not advocating self-mutilation for sin. 
These people don't need eye and hand surgery. They need radical heart surgery by the great physician. That's what everybody needs. And on the heels of teaching about adultery, Jesus talks about divorce. The Jewish religious leaders trivialized the covenant of marriage to the point that all they needed to do not to be in the wrong was to make sure they gave the wife a certificate of divorce so that she would have the right to remarry. They taught whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. The Pharisees and religious leaders of Jesus' day had twisted the Old Testament to provide easy divorces for any man who wanted out of a marriage for any reason, and it was widespread. In Malachi 2, God reprimands the priests who were divorcing their Jewish wives that they'd married when they were young in order to take foreign wives or when they were committing polygamy by not divorcing the first wife and just bringing on a second. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells them the real meaning of the law. He said, I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And Chris, it's important to note that God never advocated polygamy. No, he never did. That was a man thing. He always said, one man, one woman. Absolutely. There were two schools of thought among the Jews at the time regarding divorce. It was okay for any reason, and it was not okay unless there was sexual immorality. Jesus deals with these men who were divorcing their wives for any reason at all, even bad cooking, or to marry someone more beautiful, and even goes so far as to say they were, in effect, forcing their wife to commit adultery. Many commentators believe that that was because at the time, women largely had to marry again or resort to prostitution to survive. Therefore, without a proper divorce, she and anyone she married would be committing adultery. And Jesus does not accept the practice of obtaining easy divorces. He does say that divorce is condoned by God in the case of adultery. And Paul says it's the same thing with desertion in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 15. Like all sin, divorce for wrong reasons is forgivable by God, though. We want to make sure that that's clear. It is a forgivable sin, like the rest. And we have to consider carefully the definitions of some words. For instance, the Greek term for marital unfaithfulness is broad in some of the areas of sexual sin and other vile and decent acts. A quote from Ligonier Ministry says, Matthew 19.9 gives us one case in which divorce is allowable, sexual immorality. This term translates the Greek word pornea, which can cover a wide variety of sexual sins, and not just a physical relationship between a person and another who is not his or her spouse. Repeated impenitent sexual sin is proper grounds upon which the injured spouse may seek a biblical divorce. And I want to quote one more here in this divorce section. Kevin DeYoung says, On the one hand, I think it's possible that God did not mean to give us every possible grounds for divorce in the New Testament. Jesus gave one, and Paul, admittedly under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, mentioned another one relevant to the Corinthian situation. So might there be one or two other grounds for divorce? Perhaps. And yet, if you say that, you open up Pandora's box of trouble. People will argue that psychological abuse is grounds, and emotional neglect is the grounds, and maybe terrible unhappiness is grounds for divorce. I think it's safer biblically to maintain that there are two acceptable grounds for divorce. But having said that, I could envision in extreme situations the elders might conclude this man or woman has not completely disappeared, but his life is tantamount to desertion. If a guy's strung out on drugs, gambling all their worldly possessions, and has repeatedly beaten his wife, might not that count as desertion at some point? Good quote. Going on to verses 33 to 37 of Matthew 5, Jesus says, Again, you have heard it said of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. The Jewish religious leader said, don't break your oath to the Lord. But Jesus says, don't take an oath at all. So is this a prohibition not to take an oath at all, like even if you're on the witness stand? No. 
Jesus himself agrees under oath invoked by the high priest in Matthew 26, 63. Paul invoked God as his witness in Romans 1, 9. God takes an oath in Hebrews 6, 17. So if these three instances happen, this can't be a prohibition against all oaths. No, it can't. What Jesus is getting at here is stop invoking God's name as some kind of guarantee that what you're saying is true. And we all heard this. Yes. People swearing to God yep. that what they say is true. Instead, just say what you mean and mean what you say. Speak as though everything you say is under that type of oath. And then go live it out. Your character should be of such integrity that others will believe you when you say something. Or when you say that you'll do something. There's more to this section about taking oaths that Jesus is highlighting in his description of the true intent of this. God is sovereign over everything. You can't change the hair on your head. So don't swear by heaven, the throne of God, or by his footstool, which is the earth, or by Jerusalem, or even your own head. Why? You're not in charge of any of it. Not even your own head. (laughs) That's right. That's a great point. We can swear or take an oath to do something, but God's in charge of all of our days. James 4, 13 to 15 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town or spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Good verses to remember. Now, let's move on to something that's been misunderstood a lot, and that's the teaching on retaliation. The religious leaders taught an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But the original intent of Exodus 21:24, Leviticus 24:20, and Deuteronomy 19:21 was the punishment should fit the crime. But the Jewish religious leaders were sometimes exacting a greater punishment than fit the crime sometimes even applying standards differently due to social class, and they thought they weren't doing anything wrong. And they weren't leaving punishment up to the court system. They were using it in their private affairs to exact revenge on people. Jesus isn't saying here that no one should ever be punished for doing wrong. God gave us government and authority for the good of mankind to keep peace and order. Though you'd never know it now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Judges and court systems, as well as police and other law enforcement agencies, are entrusted with defending the community for its good. The point is, we should not seek revenge. And Jesus doesn't just clear up wrong thinking about those three verses, and he doesn't just address the fact that the Pharisees were exacting greater punishment and stop there. Jesus tells them some things that go totally against all of our sinful human nature, and he says, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone should sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. But this begs the question, if someone slaps me on the cheek, do I really have to, in a sense, let them hit me on the other one too? No. And I would No. I wouldn't either. (laughs) Jesus is saying that genuine Christian love makes us willing to accept a second wrong done to us rather than exacting revenge. And some commentators point out that if we were to literally turn the other cheek, we would be in a way coaxing the other person to continue sinning by striking us again. That's a good point. It's not easy to do, but it lines up with a lot of other scripture. In the next verse, Jesus mentions someone suing you for your tunic. The tunic was the undergarment the people wore. The poor sometimes only had these undergarments. The rich, however, had many and often wore more than one because it was a sign of wealth. There was also an outer garment used for clothing by the rich, but as a bed cover at night by the poor who had them. Exodus 22:26 forbids someone to keep a person's outer garment they'd taken for a pledge overnight because the person would need it for warmth. But Jesus is saying here that if someone sues you for your undergarment, or like in Luke's gospel, forcibly takes it from you, give them your outer garment as well. And then Jesus talks about going the extra mile with someone who forces you to go with them. The word translated shall compel, like to go the extra mile, is Persian. To make sure that royal commands were delivered 
with safety and got to the different parts of the empire, Cyrus stationed horsemen at proper intervals on all the great public highways. One delivered the message to the other and then to the next and so on and so on. And these heralds were permitted to compel any person or to press any horse, boat, ship, or other mode of transportation they might need into service to deliver the king's commandments. Jesus is saying, don't resist a public authority requiring your aid. If they ask you to go a certain distance, go twice the distance with them. Does this mean we sit idly by and take whatever is happening to us or someone else and do nothing to prevent it? Ever? No. Definitely not. No. And I like how Barnes' commentary puts it. The general principle which he laid down was that we are not to resist evil, that is, as it is in the Greek, nor to set ourselves against an evil person who's injuring us. But even this general direction is not to be pressed too strictly. Jesus did not intend to teach that we are to see our families murdered or be murdered ourselves rather than make resistance. The law of nature and all laws, human and divine, justify self-defense when life is in danger. It cannot surely be the intention to teach that a father should sit by coolly and see his family butchered by savages and not be allowed to defend them. This goes along with what Paul says about not resisting one who is evil when he says, overcome evil by good in Romans 12, 21. And I like John Calvin's commentary on this passage too. He says, Jesus is telling us that the end of one contest will be the beginning of another and that through the whole course of their life, believers must lay their account with sustaining many injuries of uninterrupted succession. When wrong has been done them in a single instance, he wishes them to be trained by this example to meek submission that by suffering, they might learn to be patient. And moving on to the last section of Matthew 5, let's talk about verses 43 to 48. Following teaching about revenge, Jesus clears up a misunderstanding caused by the added interpretation of Leviticus 19.18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The rabbis taught, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. They thought that being told to love your neighbor meant that you could hate your enemies. Yeah, they obviously missed any part about all of humanity being God's enemy. Obviously. Jesus turns their thinking totally upside down. He tells them, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You must therefore be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus tells us about being a neighbor in Luke 10, 25-37 in the parable of the Good Samaritan. When God speaks of our neighbor, he's talking about everyone, even our enemies. Yep. As much as we don't like to think of that sometimes. Yep. Our sovereign God sends the rain on the just as well as the unjust. He shines the sun on both also. He gives good things to those who love him as well as good things to those who hate him. We're to imitate our Heavenly Father. Hard as it is, like you said. Yeah, I amen to that, but it, you're right, it's hard. And we have to end there. If you like what you heard today, leave us a review on whatever podcasting site you're listening to. And don't forget to check out our website, Proverbs910Ministries.com, as well as our Facebook page by the same name. And while you're on Facebook, take a look at our No Half Truths Allowed Facebook page. If you buy the book and companion study, drop us a comment and we'll send you a special link to our private YouTube page, which has accompanying free teaching videos that go along with each lesson. Have a blessed day, everyone.